Okay, good morning. We continue in the Sefer Shari Tshuva. We're about to begin a Sifhei in our second week in the Shari Tshuva. Rabbein Yon is speaking about the perils of delaying Tshuva. And we ended off in the fourth Sif. We talked about how Hashem can understand how you make a mistake the first time. But if you already see that you're weak in this area and you don't, try to change that shows there's a certain non-interest in changing and that is much worse this is one last uh, example I wanted to give to kind of show the idea before we move on to Sivhei there is a concept in the Torah of Gedorim of fences that the rabbis enacted the rabbis enacted rabbinic decrees to ensure that we don't transgress the biblical um, uh, mitzvahs of the Torah so it would uh, and there's all kinds of rabbinic decrees that we have in terms of how much before Pesach we're not allowed to eat chametz um, biblically you know there's a debate exactly what it is uh, from chatzos of Erev Pesach and the rabbis added an extra an extra couple hours and things like that. The rabbis made all these kinds of laws. Uh, certain relatives are biblically forbidden to be married, and the rabbis added a few more, etc., etc. It would appear that Dine Doraisa, biblical mitzvahs, should be much stronger than rabbinic mitzvahs. If God told you not to do it, it should be more important than if the rabbis told you not to do it. However, the Gemara says something fascinating uh, on a verse of the prophets. The verse says, Aravim Alai Divrei Sofrim. Come on, read this says this. The Aravim Alai Divrei Sofrim, the words of the Sofrim are more pleasant to me, says Hashem, than Yoser Miyene Shal Torah, more so than the wine of the Torah. Which means to say, God is saying that the Divrei Sofrim, the performance of rabbinic mitzvahs is more pleasant upon me than you're performing the secrets of the Torah. Which seem to say that rabbinic adherence to Torah is more pleasant to Hashem than biblical adherence to the Torah. That's what it says. So what's the logic for that? <coughs> Certainly we can't say that a rabbinic mitzvah takes precedent over a biblical mitzvah. So what does it mean? Although you will find something very interesting. You will find, for example, this year. This year, Rosh Hashanah, the first of Rosh Hashanah is Shabbos. And we will not blow the shofar. We won't blow the shofar. Why aren't we going to blow the shofar? The answer is, the rabbi said we can't. Why? Because if we blow the shofar on Shabbos, could be, uh, not everybody lives in Toronto that has an A roof. Uh, if you go, you know, many summer places don't have A roofs. I'm sure many of us experience that if they've been away this summer. And uh, you may unwillingly, unknowingly, um, carry the shofar in a public domain, which would be transgressing a biblical commandment. So therefore, Today, this year, while that's not a problem in Toronto, no Jew will hear the chauffeur in Toronto because it's rabbinic decree. So really, we even see that a rabbinic decree at some times can even override a biblical decree, which really always needs a bit of explanation. But what's the general idea over here? So the answer is like this. When a person does a biblical mitzvah, the raisa, real, you could think, and it could be very well be, and it often is, that a person is performing like a technical machine. But he has, and he's done it. But he hasn't really shown that he's tremendously concerned about what Hashem wants. Because you're doing it because you're supposed to do it. A person shows a tremendous amount of concern and love for what Hashem wants. How do we know it? When he creates a situation in which he guarantees that he won't do something wrong or that he does something right. In other words, like this. If a person responds like this and says, well, listen, I'll go as things happen. If a mitzvah comes along, I'll do it. And if a, and if a vera comes along, I'll stay away from it. 
and your life is just responding to the immediate of what's happening. And, and, and if that's all that's going on, that's not really showing such a strong commitment. Because quite often, you know, when the Avera happens to come along, you, you just aren't stronger than the Avera. And uh, when the mitzvah comes along, might, you know, might, might not be in the mood to do the mitzvah. If it's just like, we'll just kind of play it by ear, kind of, um, it doesn't necessarily show there's a tremendous care and concern, right? But if a person keeps the divrei sofrim, you keep the rabbinic laws, it means that, that the biblical laws mean so much to you that you don't want to make any mistake and you'll go so far to ensure you won't make a mistake you won't even eat matzah earlier than what the Torah said okay so this is what the Gemara means when it says the sweetness of the rabbinic laws it's sweeter for me the rabbinic laws much more than the secrets of the Torah because when you keep the rabbinic laws it shows how much you care to make sure that it gets done right and this, this is from the positive side. Uh, the, this Gemara is from the positive side. Or Ben Yonah is explaining it on the negative side. Ben Yonah is saying, if you already did the Aver and you saw that you stumbled and you're still not working out, that it really shows you don't care. So we're, we gave an example of the positive. That if you keep the rabbinic mitzvahs, that shows that you do care. Now, of course, you have to have this in mind. You know, you could turn rabbinic mitzvahs into biblical mitzvahs, that you do them robotically as well. So you have to realize when people say, ah, you know, the rabbis, they wrecked by my whole Shabbos. If it wasn't for the rabbis, Shabbos would be amazing. Uh, the rabbis say you can't swim. The rabbis say you can't ride on a horse. The rabbis say all kinds of things you can't do. All kinds of things you can't pick up. Uh, their mom has spoiled the whole Shabbos. Otherwise, the Shabbos have been amazing, right? But the answer is, the rabbis understand the only way you really can enjoy Shabbos is if you're not swimming, if you're not horseback riding, and all the different things, because that's not really what Shabbos is. Okay, we have to know more about Shabbos to appreciate that. But, th but that's what he's saying over there. That's why the rabbis said you can't blow the shofar on Shabbos. Why? Because they saw in their times that the adherence to Shabbos was lacking. And they saw the whole atmosphere about Shabbos was lacking. And people were just taking a very lackadaisical attitude towards it. So the rabbi said, no, we have to ensure that Shabbos is strong. And they didn't permanently say you can't blow shofar on Shabbos. Hopefully the day will come where we will care about Shabbos the way it should be. And therefore it will be back to the way that it should be. It, it all goes back to really what I said at Shalashudas, you know, the whole idea of, you know, the first verse says you will go out to battle against your enemy. The secret is right there. You have to go out to battle, not wait to be attacked. You have to go out to battle. And then it says, and then Hashem will give him over into your hand. It's a guarantee. If you go out to battle, Hashem will give him over to your hand. Why? If you go out to battle, it shows you care. If you wait to be attacked, uh, and, and you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. So you have to go out to battle. So that's what Rabbi Yona is saying. So I'm just giving an example from the positive side to what Rabbi Yona said from the negative side. Okay, let's now continue with Sif Hey. We're on page six and seven at the bottom of the page. He's continuing to talk about the perils of delaying tshuva. Hasheni, the second item. It's really more than two already, but uh, he's calling it the second item. Hashenis kiha shona becheto, a person who repeats his sins, tshuvaso kasha. His tshuva is hard to do. It's harder to do tshuva on a repeat of era than on a era you've only done once. Kinasalo achet keheter. Because the sin that he has done becomes, as they say, a heter, has become a permissible thing. Ubaze kovda meod chataso. And with this, it makes the sin even heavier, makes it stronger. So, first of all, what does it mean it makes the sin stronger? I mean, it makes the sin stronger. So one of the commentaries says, because when a person stumbles the first time in Avera, the first time you do it, it's not so gishmak to do the Avera. It's not so tasty to do the Avera. You start thinking, should I do it, should I not do it? 
there are tinges of guilt the first time you cross that threshold. And it's not like you really enjoy the Aver as much as you could, you know. Uh, and therefore, if God has to punish you on it, you know, it will punish you commensurate to how much you enjoy doing the Aveira. Because he's going to have to pull you away from that Aveira. The treatment to get you away from the Aveira doesn't have to be as strong because you really didn't enjoy it that much the first time. It's, it's pretty rare a person enjoys the Aveira the first time if they haven't been doing it. First time's not that enjoyable. But once you start repeating it and the guilty feelings go away, oh, then you really, you're enjoying that Aveira. So now that God is going to have to give you a lot stronger medicine to get that away from you. So that's what he, that's one interpretation why the chet is uh, the punishment. The the chet is stronger because of that. There's other interpretations, but that's on a simple level. So what does he mean over here? Kinase lo hachet the, the the sin becomes one of permissible. So again, the concept is obvious. You know, a person can only deal with uh, an action being negative for only so long. And after a while and after doing it, the person has automatically accepted this as something that's permitted. Why? Because from a psychological point of view, a person can't live with the conflict uh, of doing the wrong thing. We all are ingrained and by nature to think we're good people. And that, that's important for us to feel that way or we won't have any good self-esteem. If you're walking around from the get-go thinking you're not a good person, that's not a healthy way to live. And Hashem didn't create us that way to initially think we're not good people. So we generally think we're good people unless we have psychological problems. But generally it's a healthy way to think you're a good person. So how can you think you're a good person if you've done something that God says is a bad thing? So obviously the first time you do it, there is conflict. You know you shouldn't be doing this. And... Uh, you just, uh, you feel bad. Now, there's other psychological reasons that are getting you to do what you shouldn't be doing. So there's this conflict. Over, your, your body drives to do this. Your conscience says you shouldn't be doing this. So you're in this conflict. But then after a while, person begins, the, the, the system within the person automatically is able to, over time, help the person deal with the conflict how? By accepting the behavior as not being so negative. So then at the point it even becomes a mitzvah. It even becomes a mitzvah. And, and therefore it not only becomes a mitzvah, uh, or keheter, keheter, but then eventually becomes a mitzvah. But, and then it makes the people feel a lot better. You know, this is one, one simple example. One simple example, which we have to deal with all the time. You know, people become less observant. They become less, there's challenges in life. People become less observant. And then um, uh, their children become much less observant. You know, it's like, you know, people came from orthodox homes, and then they say, you don't have to be so orthodox. You know, kashrut uh, isn't that important, but oh, we'll try to keep it a little bit, or keep the traditional, to fall from, from religious to traditional. Right? So then what happens with the kids? So the kids come home and say, Oh, Dad, I want you to know I've been going out with, uh, with Mary and uh, like we're very happy with each other. We'd like to get married. And, and they find out that Mary is not exactly a Jewish woman. So then uh, the parents uh, you know, can react very negatively. But, after, but then after a while, they come to terms with it, and instead of losing their child, they come with a new philosophy. It's a new philosophy. The philosophy is family comes first. Yeah, family is the most, this becomes the new religion. Family is everything. So then, then if God forbid another one of the children do the most reprehensible thing possible to become observant, then they are the ones that are tearing apart the family. You see. Now why do they have to do that? Because they have to sustain the original mistakes that they made. You know, and even if, like, even if th this family would have thought that intermarriage is the worst thing in the world, and, and, the, and they said, like, how would it ever be? But you know what, you gotta live, you gotta live, and you gotta come to terms with life. So therefore, 
you know, intermarriage is fine, it's not taboo. And, uh, you know, you find nowadays, you know, uh, rabbis are, have to change their form of talk. Used to be you could talk 15, 20 years ago and, and you'd, you'd scare the congregations. You don't want your kids to marry out. No. So you have to come to shul on shops and you know that. Now, it's, it's, it's not taboo. It's not taboo. And people are so intermarried. So it's end of it. As long as we have a family. And, and why are you so stubborn that we have to, that you're not going to come, so, so, so Mary is christening, uh, Mary and, uh, and uh, Sam uh, are christening uh, their baby, their son Christopher, and uh, so, so why are you not coming to the, to the baptism? What's the matter with you? It's, it's family. If everything's for family. So, you know, of course, we're not going to, I can't argue the point at that point. And, and I see you're breaking up the whole family. Why aren't you coming to the church? You know, we'll come to the, you know, we came to the synagogue when you got married. So at least come to the church. It's, it's all kinds of problems. And people need a lot of guidance how to deal with parents under these situations. You know, but the answer is it's, it's family isn't first either. It's, it's your ego is first. That's what it really is. It's your own new religion. But that, that's how you act. And that, that, that's how it becomes a mitzvah. It's the only way you can live with yourself is by saying that this thing is heter, you know, to the point that people, you know, they think you're crazy. You go to certain synagogues where people talk. Where people talk. So, you know, it, it, it's not that it's wrong. It's not that it's a heter. It is mamish, a mitzvah to talk. And there are people who join shuls because they talk. Hmm. It's such a friendly shul. You know, it's so, it's so wonderful that we can come and socialize and do all these things. And, and as I spoke about on, on Tisha B'Av, if you recall, how, what the Hassam Sofer had to say about talking in shuls. When you talk in shul, what did we say? You, you're giving over the power of the shul to the other side. And you're turning the shul into a church. Right? So, so that's, it's, and your prayers are not accepted at all. So, but, it, but it, and it's my mission miss because a person can't, and, and, if, and if a Baal Shuba comes into the shul and tells the person to be quiet, they throw him out. They throw him out. What's the matter with you? Right. So that it's all part of that, what Rabbein Yon is saying. You know, if you do this, you think so. So certainly that, that's from a psychological point of view. From a spiritual point of view, when a person does something negatively wrong, there's a certain amount of what we call uh, timtum halev dullness of the heart, certain amount of impurity and negative atmosphere that's created by the negative activity and that negative atmosphere desensitizes the person to spiritual sensitivities and after a certain point of time you just lack that spiritual sensitivity to sense that you're even doing anything wrong and you know we all, we all are created a very fine acute antenna which are able to pick up the wavelengths of spirituality in a correct way and to be able to pick up things that aren't good and to know that you should put them away. But we know, you know, if there's too much traffic, it's too much static, on the wavelengths things aren't getting through. So the avers that we do is all that static that doesn't let those spiritual concepts come through. So when we keep repeating averos, it means you're intensifying the static in all the negative atmosphere that doesn't allow simple, pure messages to get through that you would normally in the past have been sensitive to. So that's another reason why it gets worse. And, and also the simple concept is habit. The rabbis say that ha-hergel nasa Habit becomes second nature. So therefore, Rabbi Niona is telling us the following. Number one, we already learned last week that Hashem is very disappointed and upset with us, you know, why should, because of our sins, so why shouldn't you want to remove that? That's number one. Number two, you have to understand that if you would have corrected your mistake already, you would have had the power to correct it, and you'd be able to face it, this, and, and if you corrected it, you'd be able to face it the second time. That's all we learned last week. Now Rabbi Yon is saying by continuing to do those actions, it becomes from your point of view very, very difficult to correct it afterwards. And these are all reasons why Rabbi Yon is saying we should not be delaying the truth. And certainly in Elul is the time, if any time, to deal with these issues. So let's continue inside. So why is this Avera more difficult? Why is it heavier? Kimoshinemar, as the Pasuk says, the Prophet says, 
Yermiyahu, Hine Dibart, you have spoken. Vatasya Ros Vatucho. And you have done the evil things, Vatucho. What does Vatuchal mean? Beir Vatuchal. What does the word Vatuchal mean? Kiaros Nasus Loch Kehet. Because the evils that you've done have become permissible. Ukidover Shahu Biacholtech Ubirshusef. And it is now something that is Biacholtech. It is permitted to you. Ubirshusech. It's, it's amongst your rights. And he explains, Miloshan from the expression, Lo Suchal Lechovisharecha. Lo Suchal. You're not able to eat these things in your gates. Shetarguma, the targum, the Aramaic targum of the word lo suchal is leis loch rishu. You don't have permission. You're not capable, you're not able. So so what, what's the Pusik really saying? The Pusik saying, Let's look what happened. You have spoke about the Averis, you have done this, vatuchal, and you're able, you, you feel it's permitted. Vatuha is the third step. You speak about the Avera, you do the Avera, and then Vatuha, I can do it. It's okay. It's, it's, it's nothing wrong with it. And some little church says, you know, you, what are you doing? Says, what's the matter? Well, what's wrong with that thing? It's a very good thing to do this. So that's the problem. Vamarab, we're at the top of page 8 and 9. Vamarab, the Senate, the Colonel of Rach, and the rabbis of blessed memory said, Cave and Shavar Adam Aver Vishanaba. Once a person transgresses an Aver and repeats it, Nasis Lokahatr becomes permissible. The Amr Rabbah said in Shivan Lavacha, and the rabbis of blessed memory told us. Al Ish Shavar Aver Vishanaba, when a person transgresses and then repeats, they say says a very scary thing. Kimikon Va Elach im Yafsha Vlasis Avera Venenas Vuloa saw. From now on, once it's become habitual, if the person merely thinks to do the Avera and bananas, and he's prevented somehow from doing the Avera, the law saw, and he didn't do it at the end, the evil thought is connected to the action as if you did it. We'll explain that in a second. Volov Namar, and on this, Yermiel said, God says, I will bring evil upon these people. And what will I bring evil for? You think evil for the Averis they physically did. But then the Navi says, pre even for the fruits of their thoughts. I will punish them even for the thoughts that they have. So what's going on over here? So the, 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 the understanding is like this. Under normal circumstances, what is the halacha? What, 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 is, what happens when a person plans to do an Avera and he doesn't do an Avera? He doesn't get down to doing it at the end. He was thinking about it. Should I, should I speak this Lash and Har? Should I not speak this Lash and Har? Should I take revenge on this person? Should I not take revenge on this person? And really they want to. And say, hey, I think I'm going to do it. And then, then he fights himself. Like, no, no, I, I don't think. Maybe I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And eventually he doesn't do it. But for, for many minutes, he was thinking he wanted to do it. And, and there was a time he really wanted to do it, but then he overpowered himself and he didn't do that. Where, where, where is the spiritual balance sheet? So in, term, in terms of sins, the spiritual balance sheet is zero. And not only that, there could even be a bit of positive because he worked hard to overcome and he didn't do it and he held himself back from doing it. And that already can even be looked at as a positive. And that's the way we generally look at things. Machshava ra lo mitzdarefes lamasa. An evil thought is not connected to action, as it were. That's true in everything except for, by the way, except for avodazara, idol worship. If you think of doing idol worship, even if you don't, you've transgressed already, because that itself is already a transgression. All right? That already entails a certain denial of God's omnipotence. If you could even think to do that, but that's the exception. I don't think too many of us are thinking about a But, um, uh, but certainly, uh, but but on the other hand, we have to realize it doesn't mean even if you held yourself back, you know, there still is a certain detriment in thinking about an avera. I mean, it's not exact. It would have been a lot better if you weren't thinking about that avera. Right, but okay. So you were thinking about it, but in the scales of justice, you're not punished for doing uh, the aver merely because you planned on doing it. It's not considered as part of your real thought stages. 
right? And, and we've discussed this topic, it's one of my favorite topics uh, that, we, that we talk about uh, because there, there's a reverse concept of this as well. Machshava tova mit starefes lamaisa. But a good thought is connected to action, right? If you intended to do a mitzvah and you weren't able to do a mitzvah, it's considered as if you did the mitzvah. So I've already explained that that cannot be what the mish, what the Gemara means, because if you didn't do a mitzvah, you didn't do a mitzvah. So you can't. At the end of the day, it it, it, it doesn't really say it's as if you do the mitzvah. It says it says the so Hebrew is mitzarefes. It's like connected. It's attached. So, 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 what does that mean? So just in general, it's good to know this idea. When it says machshava tova means the refes So, when you when you do a a, a a a mitzvah, so how much credit do you get from God? How much closeness do you get from God? So we think it's for what I did. You 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 gave you gave tzedakah. So you'll get a mitzvah for giving tzedakah. Okay. Now, was there any thought involved before you gave the tzedakah? Yeah. So let's say there was a, there was a certain amount of uh, conflict that you had to go through. You know, I don't know, I don't know if I can give this year. It's been a tough year, and you're thinking, you're debating. You say, you know, no, I really should give it. You know, thinking about, it, I really want to give it. It's a good thing for me to do, and you really have a good thought. You know, and you know, and come tomorrow, I'm going to go and I'm going to write a check and I'm going to give tzedakah. So did anything good happen over there? Tomorrow you're going to give the tzedakah, and then you get the points. Do you get any points for the good thoughts? So Gemara is saying, Machshava Tova means a Revis Lamaisa. A good thought is connected to the action. Because there's there's a very interesting thing about our thoughts. Where where do you draw the line between fantasy and reality? You know, there's a lot of people who have a lot of good thoughts. A lot of good thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want a lot of things. And they really think about it. And, and then when I have the chance, I'll do this and I'll do that and I promise and this and that. And then there are some people, so how do we know that you're, how can we be honest with our thoughts? Are we really, is this what we really want or is it a fantasy? You know, you have people, for example, that uh, you, you, you ask them, you know, you know, we're planning on doing something, will you be able to help, be able to volunteer? And they say, sure, sure, no problem. No, just ask. Just ask, and I'll be there. You know, the, the perennial, if there's anything I can ever do for you, baloney. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> they could do for you. You hear this line, you know, per person's an awful, oh, I'll do anything to help. And you come up, a couple, then a couple days later they call, you know, they need help, can you, can you do a carpool for them? Oh, it's Wednesday. Oh, I, I can't. I can't do it today. I, I, I've, I got to take my kid to hockey practice. Please. Then you call them on Thursday. Well, maybe can you run an errand for them? They need help to go to Sobeys. I just came back from Sobeys. I can't go back. And at the end of the day, they don't do anything. What happens? I'll do anything for you because they're fantasizing. They don't really want to do anything for you, but it sounds really good. And you know, doesn't it feel good to say? If you need anything, I'll do it. Just say it. It feels great. You feel like you're exotic. You might feel like, you know, like, mom, if there's anything you need, I'll, it sounds so altruistic. And I'm not saying there aren't a couple people who do that. But I find, I find as the mission Pirkei says, the more people say they're going to do it, I know in my mind, forget it. They're doing nothing. And, 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 and all you do is you're wasting your time calling them because they're not going to do anything for you. So these are people who fantasize. They fantasize, and the truth is, they didn't really think about what it means to say, whatever you need, I'll do it. They fantasize, and there's a lot of people on Rosh Hashanah who fantasize a lot. Comes Rosh Hashanah, comes Yom Kippur, and you're getting a little serious, you start thinking, and say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to really start to learn to read Hebrew this year. I'm going to really uh, start uh, to learn Gomorrah properly this year. I'm going to give more tzedakah, whatever. Now, how do we know if they're fantasizing or not? At the end of the day, there's only one way to know if you're fantasizing or not. Did they do it? Or did they at least make a great effort to do it? You know, maybe and they really tried and, and, they, and they really did things, but it just didn't come out. 
So, but if, if, but if nothing, then they fantasize. So what does it matter? It matters a lot. Because all that thinking, does it give you any, does it earn you any points in Shemayim? Does that thinking, was it worth anything? So the Gemara says, you know, if you really think about things, and it's not a fantasy, then, then it's, it's not considered as if you did it. But it is considered if you did it. What do you mean? So, no, let's put this in. Like, doing is worth a certain amount of points, and thinking is about worth a certain amount of points. So now, how do you know if you're getting thinking points? So the answer is simple. Once you do it, then you get the points for doing and the points for thinking. You get both. Because then the thinking was a real thinking, wasn't it? So you get points for it. If you don't do it, then you don't get points for the thinking because you must have been fantasizing. So Gamora is saying, if you really wanted to do it, but it, was a, but it was an onus, it was against your will, and you couldn't do it. You said, you know, the rabbi said I have to come to shul in the morning, I'm going to come to shul in the morning. He said I have to come to learn at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to come at 6 o'clock in the morning. And the person thinks about the whole Shabbos, I'm going to come at 6 o'clock. So is it a fantasy or not? So we know very soon, is he there at 6 o'clock or not? What happens, he set the alarm. And uh, he set the alarm, and then the power went out in the middle of the night and then it didn't ring, and he slept, there was no alarm. He didn't come to shul that day. Now the question is, did he get points for thinking or not? So only the Almighty will truly know the answer to that. But if the Almighty knows that had the alarm rung, he would have been there, or let's even say better, let's say he got up, he got in the car, he turned the ignition on, and the battery was dead. Okay, and now, so now for sure he wanted to go, right? So, so the machshava tova, the good thought, mitzarevus lamaisa, it's considered as if he did it. What does it mean? He did it to the point that his thinking wasn't a fantasy. It's considered as if he did it, which would have been the proof that his thinking wasn't a fantasy. And I'll get credit for the thinking. That's what that Gemara means. It doesn't mean it's as if you did it, you got points for doing it, because you didn't do it. God can't reward you for doing something you didn't do. That's not logical. But he can reward you for thinking about it. And in many ways, thinking is even greater than doing. So you were, that's what it means. If you thought, really meant to do it, it's as if you did it, that that's the proof. That would have been the proof to get credit for the thinking. So you get credit for the thinking. That's on the positive side. So let's look at the negative side. Machshava ra lo mitzarefes lomais. You were thinking you do something wrong and it's not credit as if you did it. It's, 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 it, it's not like you did it. Why? But I, I was thinking to do it. I was thinking to do it. But the answer is a Jew in his soul, in the deepest part of a Jew, is a Jew never really wants to do any Averis. A Jew never wants to do an Avera. When a Jew thinks of an Avera, it's always a fantasy. It's always a fantasy. It's always a fantasy. Because the Neshama doesn't want to do Averis. Really doesn't want to do Averis. And the, the, the um, default position of a Jew, the default position of a Jew is that they don't want to do Averis. However, if, if the person really does it, <laughs> then uh, he hasn't been fantasizing. And and therefore it, it's, it's like you really then then it's no longer fantasies. But even if he's thinking hard to do it and doesn't do it, there's already this debate amongst the rabbis. But you know you're thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. But you know, till you're going to do it, it t takes a lot more for the person to do the aver. And therefore, you know Hashem in His kindness, He does not consider it. We're very far. Our nature is not to be bad. Our nature is to be good. Really deep down, every Jew. Every Jew is a tzaddik. Just got to find it. You got to find it. That's the default. The default this is not to do averis, it's to do mitzvahs. So and, and therefore, that? when we're thinking about mitzvahs, you know, really that is who we really are. But unfortunately, people could be fantasizing. But averis, not, not as much fantasy as reality. But the point of the matter is, though, and this is what Rabbi Neon is saying, if you constantly do something wrong, you know, if you keep on doing it wrong, 
then you've changed the default position. Change you've changed the default position. And, you know, till, you know to, before you really do an Avera, is a lot, like we said, it's not enjoyable. It's not enjoyable because there's so much negative in there. There's so much not wanting to do it. But the Yetzirah pushed you over the top to do it. But when it gets to the point now where, where, you, where you're used to doing it, then that become, you've changed the default position totally. And now, and this is what he's saying, now even if you think to do Avera, and now you are held back from doing the Avera, you know, and, or let's say you see, you know, today, I, 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 yeah, I'm going to go again to McDonald's today, you know, and, and then, you know, it didn't come out, whatever, a little, a little rushed, okay, I won't go to McDonald's today. It's not because you were fighting hard to not do it. It's because you wanted to do it. And uh, or that person talks a lot of lush and horror. And every day, you know, they talk lush and horror. And, 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 gonna, gonna, and usually they, they meet at the uh, second cup with their friends to talk lush and horror. And uh, I just didn't come out today to go to second cup to talk lush and horror. Right? Hashem considers it as if you, in your thoughts, you were thinking about going to second cup and you know what's going to happen and to talk Lashon Har. It, it came out, you weren't able to do it. Hashem considers it as if, as if you thought about it and got punished for it as if you had done it. And that's, and that, that's, that's a very bad situation. In other words, you've changed the default position of the person. And therefore, that, that now, you're, you're working at the opposite. Till not was when you're thinking to do mitzvahs, you'll get credit for the mitzvahs. Because the default position was to do the mitzvahs. Now you've changed the default position, which now creates all kinds of negative things for, for the person there. Okay. So that's, that's what Rabbi Yon is saying over there. Okay. Now, let's, uh, let's move on to the next point over here. Uh, okay, we finished hey, so we're on to Vav. Okay. Was there, I answered your question? Yeah. yeah. Does that mean then uh, that you were saying before that deep down the Neshama doesn't want to do evil, doesn't want to do bad? But does that mean that if he does it more frequently, his Neshama... No, 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 you're a good question. If the person does Avera a lot, does it mean now the Neshama really wants to do the Avera? It, it's not, the deepest part of the Neshama doesn't. The deepest part doesn't. But now the Neshama has gone into captivity. The Neshama has gone into captivity. And now it, 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 it is forced, as it were, to, to, to do it against its will and doesn't put up any fight. Deep, deep down, Hashem still doesn't want to do it. But that part isn't, uh, that, that part of the wavelength isn't getting through anymore. The static is so strong that you're not picking up that wave and it's not part of your conscious reality anymore. Yeah? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. It's the Yetzirah part, part of the Neshama. The Yetzirah is not part of the Neshama. It's coming from the body. It's that coming from that part the of the body. It could be from that part of the mind that is being controlled by the body. Not part of the mind that's controlled by the Neshama. Okay. Then so the, mind, the, the mind is up for grabs. The mind, the mind is part of your body. It's no different than the heart and your legs and other things. It can, can do more, more amazing things, but it's still a physical body. The, the question, the mind is a physical body. The question is, who rules the mind? The body or the higher levels of soul? The higher levels of soul, then the, the mind becomes a wonderful beacon of light uh, uh, to express the neshama within the person. If the body takes hold, then the mind becomes the tool of the Yetzirah. Could it say Yetzer Adam Rami Yisodo? The Yetzer, the Yetzer of the person is Rami Nura, but it's not the Neshama, not the Neshama, not the Neshama, not the Neshama. The Neshama is not is not evil at all, and it's not Yetzer is not part of the Neshama. The Yetzer can capture the Neshama, can capture the Neshama, but he is not the Neshama at all, not the Neshama at all. Okay, let's continue with love. Continuing with the pitfalls of delaying tshuva. Vata now, bina shimazos. Understand and listen to this. Kihu Ika got to listen to a very important point. Emes hadover, the truth is, kiyesh means sadikim shenichsholim bechet lipomim. There are tzadikim who will sin on occasion. 
Kenyan Shinemars, it says in Kohelis, as King Solomon said, Ki Adamain Sadik Barasa Shayasatov Alo Yechata. For man is such that there isn't a righteous person who will do good and will not sin. Everybody's going to sin. Okay, Koshim Es Yitzra Me'as Pam. But they conquer their Yetzirah hundreds of times. Vim Yiplu Bechet Pamachas. And if they sin, they fall into sin once. Lo Yishu, they don't repeat it. Vinakotu Bifneim. And they kind of hold it in front of themselves. They analyze it. They grab it. Vechosim Yishu. They do but if a person isn't careful about a specific sin, and doesn't accept upon his soul to guard himself from it, even if from the lighter of sins, even though he's careful for every other sin of the Torah, you're careful on all 612, but there's one that you don't really take very seriously. Karoh Chachmi Yisrael, the rabbis call such a person Mumar Ledover Echad. He's an apostate in one area. An apostate is somebody who doesn't believe in the Torah. Nimna, and he is counted and considered amongst the Poshim, the, 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 rebellion, the rebellers. A Poshim Yisrael. The Godel Avonim and so is a very too great to bear. In other words, it's really bad, as we'll see. The Gemara says, He doesn't have a portion of the world to come. We'll explain that in a minute. Why? Ki, what's the reason for that? It seems not so good. He says, If a servant tells his master, Everything you tell me I'll do except for one thing. He's already old Adon of Melov. He's already broken the yoke of his master upon him. And that which is good in his eyes, that's what he does. And in this concept it says, Orur, it's coming up this, this week. Cursed is the one who doesn't uphold the words of the Torah to do them. What does that mean? Be'ura means asher lo yikavol al nafsho l'kayim kol divrei ha'tor and rosh ha'tzof. He doesn't accept upon himself to maintain the words of the Torah from the beginning until the end. V'yor al zomer, and the proof to that is because the rabbis say asher lo yokim lasos. He doesn't yokim uphold to do it. It doesn't just say, the person doesn't do it. Lo yokim. He doesn't uphold and maintain them. Lo Omer doesn't say Lo Yasasam, he didn't do them. So, so this is a very, very strong point over here. But what we have is a concept, and we'll just briefly, and tomorrow we'll elaborate on this a lot more. There's a term called in the Torah, a, a mumar. And, and probably that's the worst term you can call a Jew. Because it comes from the word mamrim, which means a traitor. A rebellious person. And they are listed amongst the people of Elam Chelek Lolam Abba. They have no portion in the world to come. There's two types of mummers. There's a mummer Lachola Torah Kula. There's a person who's rebelled against the entire Torah. He says, I don't believe in the whole Torah. There's a person that's called a mummer Ledov Rechad. He's a mummer for one thing. He's rebelled against one particular point in the Torah. And we'll see that they both don't have a Chelek Lolam Abba. Shocking. So, Romani Yon is saying, if you keep repeating one Avera all your life, and you delay Shuv in that, and it's going to become a mitzvah in your eyes, you're running the risk of not having a chilek lolom haba. Why that's so, and what the logic behind that is, God willing, we'll continue that tomorrow, Mirzashim.